Uh, hello and welcome to Matthew Reads, I guess. Now, it's rare for me that, like, I will see a book go from essentially just like a pitch tweet all the way through to publication. But, I mean, today I am talking about a book that I've literally done that with, and that is Fake Dates and Mooncakes by Shirley. But wow, what a moment. I will never forget. So yeah, um, I actually found out about this book from a tweet that Lee tweeted all the way back on, according to my notes, February 17th, 2022, saying that they'd like signed an important document about this book, and then I've been very excited about that, like this book for a long time, because that tweet literally just stayed in my bookmarks for like a year, <laughs> for like a year until this came out. Anyway, the blurb says, meet Dylan Tang. He juggles school and delivery runs for his aunt struggling Chinese takeout in Brooklyn. Winning a mooncake competition could bring the publicity they need to stay afloat. Then enter Theo Summers, a charming, wealthy customer who convinces Dylan to be his fake date to a family wedding full of crazy, rich drama. Their romance is supposed to be just for show, but soon Dylan is falling for Theo for real. With a mooncake contest looming, Dylan can't risk being distracted by rich people problems. And can he save his family's business and follow his heart, or will he fail to do both? Uh, anyway, chapter opens up on Dylan on the struggle bus just in the kitchen of the takeout. You know, he's burning food that he's meant to be cooking at the takeout place. And like, you immediately see that there's like an 11 year old running the counter. And that straight up Polar Abdul tease made me think of that meme aware of like, it's you know a Chinese takeaway is going to be good if like the walls are stark white, a child is running the counter and the people in the kitchen are yelling at each other. Like, a, you, like the place looks like it's going to be condemned, but that's when you know that the food is going to like slap your tits off. Uh, anyway, but then you see that one of the delivery drivers for Wok Warriors, which is the takeaway place, it has a flat tire, so then Dylan obviously has to take up the helm and go deliver it. You know, it's very much they're overworked, overwhelmed, so like the order ends up being wrong, and the recipient just to be, just so happens to be this rich boy who's on very much daddy's money core, who essentially starts yelling at Dylan because it took so long to get here and then is wrong. And like, yes, I understand being upset, conceptually, but like, there is no need to just like, yell at and take it out on the delivery driver. That is literally, to me, the epitome of just like, shooting the messenger. And they like, don't deserve that. That's like when customers yell at like, the minimum wage retail workers. Like, it ain't the retail worker's fault, like, nine times out of ten. Uh, anyway, Theo just happens to be also be in that apartment as well. And Dylan, even though he thinks Theo's hot, is disappointed because he thinks that the other guy on Daddy's Money is his boyfriend. You know, of the flop who ordered the food. Anyway, the second chapter, it was little more than just, like, Dylan chatting to his family once Walk Warrior had closed. And, I mean, you do get to see mention of this mooncake contest coming up. Like, it was a short little thing, you get to see a bit of info about how money is tight, and how, but how they literally just like live above the takeout place as well. Something I did like really appreciate like from this get-go was like, little bits of like Dylan's Asian culture like sprinkled in throughout the book without it just being like rammed in your, like, into your chest saying like, this is happening, you will learn. Like, it was little things about how he'd use like Chinese tea to clean the counters instead of like cleaning products. You know, various beliefs, where his other family members are around the world, like what they're doing. And I mean, in chapter three, Theo ends up turning up at Wok Warriors. And I mean, to me, it's chapter three where like the personalities of the characters really stop to like, or start popping out. Now, one thing I will say about this book is this whole book, it read like a romance movie. Like things would happen and they were just so endearingly cliche. Like I loved it. <laughs> Like, it all came off as something you would see in a romance movie. You know, but specifically, like, one of them that came out in, like, the early to mid-2000s. And also in that, it definitely came off as, like, a little hallmarky from time to time. But you know what? I was going into the book knowing that it was just going to be straight-up romance. And, like, nothing more than that. So it couldn't have disappointed me, and it delivered exactly on what I thought it was going to. And you know, also the fact that it contained the fake dating trope. Yes! Yes, Gaga, you look so good! 
like I've mentioned before that how much I love fake dating. In fact, I've literally made an entire video about how much I love it. And you know, it's one of those things of, is it the same every single time? Yes, but do I care? Absolutely bloody not. Anyway, uh, in this book, like the blurb says, you know, Dylan goes with Theo to a wedding as a fake date, but this wedding ends up being like a whole party and like weekend event up in the Hamptons. Also, conceptually, the Hamptons are so strange to me. Like, I need someone to explain to me why are the Hamptons in New York and not California? Like, I know that sounds so strange when I say it, but for some reason I always thought that the Hamptons were in California, up like Bel Air way, and not, not like, New York. Like, tell me, why are the Hamptons next door to Long Island? That does not make sense to me, and I don't know why. Uh, anyway, the fake dating in this book, it fake dates hard. I love that. And, you know, Dylan has a crush on Theo from the get-go, so he's basically just trying to stop himself from catching real feelings. And, I mean, I also enjoyed seeing, like, Dylan, like, thrust into this world far from his own. Like, not only was the book fake dating, it was also opposites attract tease as well. But, like, to an extreme. You know, Dylan and his family are facing an ev eviction, and Theo drives a Ferrari as a teenager. You know, like how I mentioned this book had a very hallmark feel to it? I think that The Opposites Attract was another blob onto that that made it even more hallmarky. So not only do we have fake dating, we have Opposites Attract and two people from like very different worlds that are so different it would just never work for them. And basically, this is just an entire section of the video of me saying how much I love a good romantic trope, that is all it is. I will say, however, I do think the book could have slowed down some at certain points. Like, there were moments where occasionally things just felt like a little bit rushed. You know, it wasn't massively regular, it was just like the occasional moment where something would be happening, or a conversation would be going on, and then all of a sudden we'd just like, the events would go to a different place. It was like, done? Like, where everything made sense, but I think like, had chapter breaks been put in, that would have just solved that issue. Literally, it's that. Um, when it came to, like, the characters, I loved Dylan's little sister, Megan. She was very much that irritating, younger sibling vibe. And I think those vibes were done very well for her. She was also a massive K-pop stan. And you know what? Good for her. Good for her. <laughs> Good for her, the shell below that as well. And I mean, like I mentioned again before, this book definitely read Hallmarky, and I think because of that, some characters felt like that as well. Like, there was a group of characters that were there just to prove a point. Like, there is one moment where Dylan is up in the Hamptons, up in New York and not California, where he just overhears a bunch of, like, rich people talking, and they were all just, like, very much stereotypical rich kids and that was one of those things where it was like very hallmarky and they were there to prove just how different <laughs> Dylan and Theo's worlds are but Mary it was great but yeah I don't know if it was just like me for some reason taking this book too seriously in the first half of the book but like this is gonna sound weird if I don't word it properly but to in the second half of the book I stopped caring and stopped taking the book seriously and just like took it at face value for what it was and then I just started having so much more fun so like I don't know why I just didn't do that from the off like it was entirely my fault so I mean overall is this book flawless? no but like I really loved it like it was so fun <laughs> You know, like I say, especially when I, like, stopped caring, just took things at face value, stopped reading into things. At that point, I just had fun and enjoyed everything. And, you know, I certainly wasn't disappointed when I'd been waiting for this book for, like, more than a year. Like, since I saw it as nothing more than just, like, a mood board tweet. Like, it was a solid romance that fulfilled everything it wanted to do. And I mean, it fulfilled everything I wanted, and I think I need to stop trying when I read, if that makes sense, and I just need to, like, take things as they are. But yeah, that's where I'm gonna leave this video, um, thank you for watching, 
Uh, feel free to like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you'd really like to, and let me know, have you read this book? Have you read Fake Dates and Mooncakes? Have you even heard of it? I'd say read it. Like, again, I loved this book. It was so much fun. Okay, bye.